Well, it's, again, very nice to have you with us in this particular part of the service. Let me just encourage you, um, in the back, in a yellow display box, you'll find these little booklets. They're uh, just made in-house. There's nothing expensive or fancy about them. We went over this last week, and let me just encourage you that you pick one up and look at it and say, you know what, Lord, I'll do this for a week. I'll just follow the pages, just one page after the next, and I think you'll find that it will enrich your time with the Lord. Many, many years ago, believe it or not, I took piano lessons. I can play most of the notes with my right hand on a good day, and on a regular day, it takes three or four tries. Now, which, what does that one mean and until you hear it right? So I was never very good, never worked very hard, I'm ashamed to say now. But at the time, we had a piano teacher from uh, Peru, Indiana, where we took our lessons. And she was a part of a cult. And she had a responsibility. She had a Bible, and it had little metal tags in it. And during our piano lesson, she had a blue chalk marker. <clears throat> she would just keep flipping the pages and just keep underlining it. And then when we'd make a mistake, she'd say, B flat, B flat, and then we'd go back and correct it. And she did this for hours. I asked her one time, I said, what are you doing? She says, oh, I mark a certain number of pages every day. And we look at that and hear about that and we think, well, that's not how you read the Bible. You don't just say, my goal this year is to underline every word, every line of the Bible. No, it's really, for us, much more involved than that. It's not a matter of trying to learn more. <clears throat> it's true we will when we have a devotional time, when we have a time spent with God. But it's intended to be a time where we fellowship with the creator of this universe that we live in. That we have a time where we begin to understand something about his ways and his purposes for our lives. So if you go through this without going through it all again, the very first page, and this has been very helpful for me, you start at the book of uh, Psalms chapter 1 for each day, and you look for something in the Psalms where you can praise God. Oh, here's a page that you'll want to write in code for fear that somebody might find your notebook. But it's very helpful to write down your sins <clears throat> so that you see them in black and white. You see how bad they are, how significant they are. And then you're reminded by that great truth that there is forgiveness in the name of the Lord Jesus in the blood that he shed. And then the next page or is a page where you begin to write your request. How many times have you promised somebody you would pray for them, and the next time you see them, you pray real fast because you've forgotten all about them? This way, when I tell somebody I'm going to pray for them, I go to this page and I write it down so that I can deal with it. A page for thanksgiving, a page for thanking the Lord. Now, you could write the same thing every day. That's not the idea. It's something that God has given to you, something that has been presented to you in such a way that you thought, you know what, that really is a special gift from God, a page to write that down. There's another page. <clears throat> where you just listen, say, Lord, what are you trying to teach me? It's a very subjective page. You know, it can get you into a lot of trouble. You know, I think the Lord wants me to be a famous actress or I'm going to move to Hollywood. It's not that kind of a thing. But I'm beginning to fill up pages there of thoughts and, and wondering, would God want me to be involved with this or to do this or to go here? The other page is a place for you to summarize what you learned that week in your Bible study, in your Sunday school class, in your church service. There's another page where you use your devotional. I've been using a daily bread plus one that I use for the teenagers. And I read those and it's either a, a reference obviously from the Old Testament or the New Testament. And O and the last one is P. And you just pick a book of Proverbs that matches the day you know, uh, today is the 18th. You go to chapter 18 and read it with the prayer. Lord, show me something in the book of Proverbs that I need to incorporate, that I need to be reminded of in my life. Here's what's really neat about this, where oftentimes 
Our devotional life stutters and stops in about five minutes. If you sit down and you say, you know what, I've got, I've got objectives for each part of what I'm doing in my time with the Lord. Before it's done, you'll find out, wow, I've been here for 20 minutes. I've been here for 25 minutes. And you will find that you began to see things differently if you're spending time with God. Now, if you have a plan that's working, we're not trying to change that. This is not God-ordained as something special, but it's been very helpful to me. And I would encourage you to just pick one up in the back. Go through it for a week. There's enough there for one week. We'll have the other sheets available as, as there's a need. <clears throat> Now, when we look at the passage today, remember what we've been doing is chronologically walking through these days of the New Testament. How the church has developed and how it's grown and, and how its doctrine is being supplied. Because much of what we learn, these important things we learn, we get a snapshot of what Paul taught these churches. Now remember, these are pagan church or pagan places, communities. Many of the people who are coming to know Christ have no background. Now in certain cities, there was a significant Jewish connection. But now as we're in these Gentile cities, they have no real background for the gospel. Paul went in and said, you believe in all these false gods. These are all the things you've been taught. Let me tell you about the one true God and the creator of all things. And so Paul, we know a little bit of what he taught by the matters that he brings up in these letters. In this particular situation, he spent quite a bit of time in Corinth. And now he writes back in this first letter and he says, Now you've had a number of questions about the things we talked about and the things that I gave to you as, as lessons from God. Let's go over some of those and I'll explain them to you again or present them to you in a better way. And in chapter 15, it's that great chapter where the theme is from beginning to end. It is the resurrection. Not only the resurrection of Christ, that is most important, but also our resurrection. I would never say it to you, nor would it be a pro, or you could say it to me, I guess. When you're going through a really hard time, a word of encouragement would be this. Don't worry. One of these days you're going to die. Now, I would never say that to somebody who's dealing with chronic pain, somebody who's going through the worst experience of their life, but there is a certain encouragement in that truth, isn't there? One of these days, we're going to die. One of these days, we're going to wake up and all of the burden of sin, the guilt and the shame, even though we know it's under the blood, we carry it because our memories are there, because the enemy comes back. The accuser of the brethren, the Satan himself, will, will speak these words of, you can't believe, you are not good enough, God doesn't want you, the Lord Jesus died for everybody but you, your sins are too great, too many, he can't. And, and we're bombarded all the time by these accusations. One of these days, we're going to wake up and we will be free. I think about those people, and can I tell you what? I am too big of a baby to deal with chronic pain. I've uh, never had to deal with pain for an extended length of time, more than just a couple of weeks. For those people who are dealing with serious health problems, that those problems have limited them in every step of life. What a great truth it is to know that someday when we die, we will experience all of these promises of God and we will be alive, fully alive for the first time. So Paul is talking about the great resurrection. In that conversation, he brings up something that he obviously must have taught before. Or maybe it reminded him of something. But either way, we see here the first time a theme is brought up in a very clear way, speaking of being in Christ. 
Then he turns, as he always does, every letter into a doctrinal presentation. So let's take a look at the passage that's written there. I'm going to read it. You can read along. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting at verse 20. Now understand, we're pulling these verses out of the context. So always go back to the context. You'll see that we skip to verse 45 in a little bit. And then after that, we'll go to Romans chapter 5 and skip through a couple of passages there. But here's what he says, <clears throat> speaking of the two Adams. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first of a great harvest of all who have died. So you see, just as death came into the world through a man, now the resurrection from the dead has begun through another man. Just as everyone dies because we all belong to Adam, everyone who belongs to Christ will be given new life. But there is an order to this resurrection. Christ was raised as the first of the harvest. Then all who belong to Christ will be raised when he comes back. The scriptures tell us the first man, Adam, became a living person. The last Adam, that is Christ, is a life-giving spirit. What comes first is the natural body. Then the spiritual body comes later. Adam was the first man, or Adam, the first man, was made from the dust of the earth, while Christ, the second man, came from heaven. Earthly people are like the earthly man, and heavenly people are like the heavenly man. Just as we are now like the earthly man, we will someday be like the heavenly man. In Romans 5, when Adam sinned, Sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death, so sin spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. Adam brought death to many. But even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of forgiveness to many through this other man, Christ Jesus. And the result of God's gracious gift is very different from the result of that one man's sin. For Adam's sin led to condemnation. But God's free gift leads to our being right with God, even though we are guilty of many sins. For the sin of this one man, Adam, caused death to rule over many. But even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of righteousness. For all who receive it will live in triumph over sin and death through this one man, Jesus Christ. Yes, Adam's one sin brought condemnation for everyone, but Christ's one act of righteousness brings a right relationship with God and a <clears throat> and new life for everyone. Because one person disobeyed God, many became sinners. But because one, one, uh, one other person obeyed God, many will be made righteous. And that's where Paul talks about this important understanding. And it really starts with much of what you'll see on the back of your page. If you turn it over, you'll see a nice chart. Comes from the MiddletownBibleChurch.org. A lot of great information there, a lot of lessons. Do you have that on the back where it says two atoms? All right, good. And you'll see here that it really summarizes what we read. There are two people we're speaking of. The first Adam is Adam. The second Adam is, of course, Jesus Christ. We see where their origin, one came from the earth, one came from heaven. One is natural, one is spiritual. One is, in one we find death, in the other one we find life. Adam was the head of the old creation. Christ is the head of the new creation. And where I want to spend a little bit of time is this one. Adam was a representative man. And he acted on behalf of the whole human race. Christ was a representative man. And he acted on behalf of the whole human race. Adam performed one act which had tremendous consequences. Christ performed one act which had even greater consequences. Adam's act was a sinful act. Christ's act was a righteous act. Adam's act was an act of disobedience and eating the forbidden fruit. 
Christ's act was an act of obedience in dying on the cross. Here is what Adam's one act produced. Death, judgment, condemnation. Here is what Christ's one act produced. Life, the free gift, grace, justification, righteousness, even reigning. Some people have said, well, I don't like this idea. It's called the federal headship. I don't like it that, that Adam in the garden, a perfect man in the perfect environment, being able to draw from perfect fellowship with his creator. I don't like the fact that Adam represents me, that I'm held accountable for Adam's act. But we know that happens all the time, doesn't it? Much of what you're doing here today, much of where you've been in your life is because somebody before you made a decision. There's a lot of conversation about your DNA now. This Christmas there's a big push to send out and find out where you come from. Somebody in all of our history way back said, you know what? I'm leaving my homeland and I'm going to go to a new place. A new place where there will be new opportunities. None of us are going to complain when we get our results back. You know, that's not fair that my great-great-great-grandfather left Ireland or England or France. I wish he hadn't have done that. No, we understand that. It doesn't matter what we think. We are where we are because somebody before us made a decision. And not all, all those decisions are easy or enjoyable. For example, the Battle of the Bulge, D-Day, all of these historical historic events that took place just a couple of generations ago. Can you imagine on D-Day, Eisenhower was our, our, our general at the time, and he looked at the plan and things were being brought and they were sorting through it and General Dwight Eisenhower made a decision. He made a decision that would cost the lives of thousands of men he was responsible for making a decision that would ultimately change the course of the entire world. Now there were people who said it's not fair that General Eisenhower gets to make that kind of a decision. It doesn't matter if it's fair. It's just the way it is, right? You might think, I wish I had been in the garden. Well, if Adam, the perfect man, in the perfect environment, enjoying perfect fellowship with his creator, was a sucker for sin, I'm guessing knowing some of you a little bit better than I know Adam, but I'm guessing you would be the same, that I would make the same wrong decision. In fact, I get up now with a determination I'm not going to do something, and the more I focus on not doing it, guess what happens? The more it keeps coming into my face. So, this is something that's very important for us to understand. We are who we are because Adam sinned. In Adam, he is the representative. He's the federal headship. He was the first one. What he did affects everything. What we do as parents will affect our children. It will affect our grandchildren. Even the children after that who may not even recognize our names. So what Paul is saying is, listen, you need to understand that you are either in Adam, that's where you were born, or you are in Christ. There's no in-between ground. The illustration you see pictured in so many books really is the right illustration. You know the one where it shows a person stepping off the pier into a rowboat? Can you stay like that very long? No, but pretty soon the boat starts to be pushed by your weight farther and farther from the pier. Sooner or later you've got to make a choice, don't you? I'm either all in the boat or all on the shore or you will be all in the water, right? You're either in the boat or you're not. Paul says, listen, you need to understand you're either in Christ or you're not. Don't, don't think, oh, I hope so. Oh, that's my heart's desire. No, what we're talking about are legal papers. For example, I know I'm married. I've got all kinds of proof. 
I say yes sir a lot. I mean yes ma'am a lot rather. I said that wrong. But she deny all that. But, but there's a lot of proof that I'm married. You know, but in the same house with the same woman for a long time. We've shared kids together, now grandkids together. But if I go to prepare for a trip overseas and, and I need to get my passport ready, guess what I have to do? I have to produce a document that says legally, right here it is, on paper, filed in the appropriate office, you are married to Beth Ann Purdy. You are now a new unit a married couple. And we understand, well, yes, there's a lot of evidence that I'm married, but the proof is in the document. Even if I didn't show any of the evidence, it wouldn't change the document. Now, we can get too far on that, but let me tell you this, that in the court of heaven, there are records kept. If you have confessed your sin, repented, received Christ, the work he did on Calvary. He was crucified for your sins. He was buried because of your great sin debt. He was raised because it was the plan of God. If you know that you were in Adam and now you are in Christ, there are documents to prove it. It is written in the Lamb's book of life. So, one thing that Paul is talking about here that is so important is, listen, Corinthians, you've got to know, are you in Adam or are you in Christ? There's no middle ground. There's no place in between that's just barely good enough. It's all or it's nothing. In Adam, you're there because you were born, whether you like it or not. Are you in Christ? So, he talks about that. But there's even more here to this important passage than just the understanding. This becomes the foundation for so many of the important doctrines. Now we won't be able to go through it, but it is so important. This explains that there is a joining together of my spirit in Christ that changes everything. This changes everything. Now I don't know if Danielle remembers this. Many, many years ago, she was really little. We had three little kids at the time. Danielle was the oldest. And we went to a friend's house and they had arranged, oh, she's, her head's in the door to hear what's being said. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, the, we were going to, go up, going to go out with this other couple. So we were there and our kids weren't used to being at other people's homes like that at that point and being babysat by a stranger and we were very comfortable with it and even then Danielle knew how how it was a big deal nobody messes with dad's keys my keys are always in my pocket I mean that's I always know where my keys are well almost always know where my keys are so I gave her my keys and I said now Danielle you don't have to worry you know we're going to come back You're, we're going to come back make sure you tell your brother and your sister you know I'm coming back because I'm giving you my keys do you remember that it was a brilliant parenting idea on my part so she kept charge of the keys that whole night I was a little fearful that she might lose my keys and we'd have to tear that house apart but she knew better than that and she had this confidence that my dad is going to come back my mom and dad will come back because they can't go anywhere without the keys because of this identification I have in Christ with Christ he tells me that he has given to me his spirit, the Holy Spirit has been given to me as a guarantee that in the future I will still be in Christ. Think about it. When I die, as a believer, when you die, you will be in Christ. You will be where he is. More than that, you will be like him because you are in him. You will reign with him because you are in Christ. You will, you will enjoy the best that he can do 
with the building of his many mansions for us, those many rooms. The very best that he does, he is doing because he knows that we are coming. What an incredible truth it is to know that we are in Christ. Now, there's something else. The implication is really important. The interpretation is not just doctrinal. It is also historical. Now, Paul goes way out and he makes a statement and it's this way or you're absolutely wrong. There's no middle ground. There's great debate about Genesis 1 through 11, chapters 1 through 11. Is this real history or is this metaphorical? Is this symbolic? Is God just writing these things to, to give us the main part of the story? Now true, he writes to give us the main part of the story. He did not write a history a historical document like we would find in a history book. He did not write science like in a science book, but it's very important. The curriculum we use for all of our Sunday school classes is designed to teach this one truth. God's word is true from Genesis 1-1 until the very end of the book of Revelation. We did not make the Bible. The Bible was revealed to us from beginning to end. We know that this is the word of God. When it is written in the manner in which it is written, it is truth. So when Genesis chapters 1 through 11 speaks of historical events, it's historically accurate. When it speaks of science, it's scientifically accurate accurate. Now the reason that's so important is not only did Jesus affirm the truth in the book of Genesis, but here Paul, the architect of our doctrine, the, the one who brought to us the biggest percentage, the biggest share of, of doctrinal truth, makes a very clear, strong statement. Because Adam is real, because what Adam did is truth, as recorded in the Bible. You are in Adam. That's the way you were born. Because he was historical and real and his actions had significance. That's why we know the second Adam, the second man, the Lord Jesus Christ, what he did is truth. What he did is significant. Because he is historically true accurate. He is there. So one of the things we've got to be careful of as parents is we've got to provide information for our children that, hey, listen, what you're being taught in many of the science classes as they go on up the, the ladder through high school, especially into college, what they're being taught in every discipline is going to attack the historical nature of Genesis 1 through 11. And I say this without it being a in-your-face kind of a challenge, but it's, a, it's an obvious challenge to anybody. If Genesis chapters 1 through 11, if those passages are not true, if that information is not accurate, if that truth is not real and genuine, then we have no guarantee that anything else is either. Paul says, listen, because all of us are in Adam, this historical figure who did this one deed of disobedience, it changed us forever. And now because of the work of Christ, because of this historical figure who did this one deed on Calvary, now our lives can be radically changed. We can be born again. By God's grace, his free gift of grace, we can be in Christ guaranteed of, of all the promises of God. This is a big deal when you read it in 1 Corinthians 15, when you read it in Romans chapter 5. Don't allow anybody to steal away the integrity of God's word. That is what we base everything on properly understanding what this book says. So, final question as we conclude the lesson is this. Where are you? In Adam, uh, we know you're in Adam. 
At the moment you were conceived, you were an Adam. In sin did my mother conceive me. I mean, right there at the very beginning, we were given that same nature that all of us share, a lost nature, a nature that is destined to rebel, a, des a nature that is destined to, to disobey. All of us are in Adam. Can you look back and say, there was a time when I understood what God says in his word, that my sin became a big deal in my life. In fact, it overwhelmed me. And I thought, I need to be saved. I need to be forgiven. Who is there that can take this sin away from me and guarantee me forgiveness and new life? And we know that that is only found in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the second Adam. Well, those are important truths. I ask that you read that passage this week. Don't just put the paper in the back of your Bible. I print them out so that you can say, doesn't really matter what Bruce said. What matters is what does the Bible say? Read it. Review it until it becomes a part of your thinking. And then pretty soon it becomes a part of your believing. All right? Hey, listen, I appreciate it. As you can tell, we have communion during this next service. Rusty will be preaching and will be leading us in the time of communion. And, of course, we invite you to stay and be a part of that. Father, we're thankful. Uh, we're just overwhelmed, honestly, to think what Jesus has done for us. Because of what he did, we have all of this all of the promises that speak of eternal life and forgiveness and glory. Lord, we're overwhelmed and we're so thankful. And we always think of that as we pray, asking that you would accomplish the will that you have for each of our lives. And we ask for that as we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. God bless you. Don't forget these notebooks in the back. Take it for a week. See if it does uh, some encouragement for you.